Hey, Walter Sorrells back with another Pops Knife Makers Project of the Month. Today, we're going old school. The Loveless Drop Point Hunter. Today, going old school. Yep, that's right, for this month's Pops Knife Making Project of the Month, I'll be doing probably the most iconic knife of the modern knife making, custom knife making movement, the Loveless Drop Point Hunter. Now, of course, this is my version, but you know, I'm not actually just guessing here. I'm cracking open the book he wrote and following the directions. I'm not gonna tell you that this is the perfect uh, reconstruction of a Loveless knife, but if you follow along, It'll be darn close. Okay, so just on the off chance you haven't heard of him, Bob Loveless is one of the founding fathers of the modern custom knife movement. Without Bob Loveless, there's probably, there's no Blade Show, there's no Blade Magazine, there's no Forged in Fire. I mean, this guy really is probably the icon of the whole modern custom knife movement. You know, Bob was one of the earliest guys to use micarta for knife handles, one of the earliest guys, well, I mean, he was one of the earliest guys to do a whole lot of stuff. Um, and his most famous knife, the Drop Point Hunter. Now, he passed away quite a few years ago now, but I mean, you can see his influence everywhere in the custom knife trade. Um, anyway, along the way, he co-authored a knife making book and we'll use that guide to keep us on track with this whole build. The stock here will be 530 seconds, giving us plenty of thickness for authentic Loveless style hollow ground bevels and tapered tangs. Alan at Pops Knife Supply has sent me a pattern to use, so I'll trace this onto the steel. Incidentally, because this build has some features that I don't typically do, I'm actually going to make two knives, one as sort of a practice blade to screw up on, and the other to try and make a little more correctly. On one, I'm scribing direct to the steel, as Bob Loveless does in the book, while the other uses layout fluid, the method I prefer, but both work just fine. Now it's over to the grinding room. First, I'll grind the profile. Loveless does this with a large contact wheel. That's cool. Personally, I prefer a flat platen, but it's totally six of one, half dozen of the other. I'm gonna use his technique just because. Every knife maker develops their own style. Loveless was kind of wheel centric. You might be different and there's nothing wrong with that. That said, in the book, he recommends 60 grit aluminum oxide belts, you know, back when I started in knife making, 60 grit AO was the go-to roughing grit, but pretty much everybody has moved to 36 or 40 grit ceramic these days. Cuts faster, cuts cooler, lasts longer. It's just a huge improvement over 60 grit aluminum oxide. So I'm overruling you on this one, Bob. We're old school here, but we're not that old school. Abrasive technology has come a long way since this book was written. Today's video is, of course, sponsored by Pops Knife Supplies. Pops has everything you need for knife making, uh, steel for both stock removal guys and hammer bangers, huge supply of handle materials, including all kinds of wood, bone, antler, horn, micarta, just all kinds of cool stuff. All sorts of abrasives, including every kind of belt you can think of, sandpaper, specialty abrasives, compound, all that fasteners, tools, I mean, I could just go on and on. And if you're following along with the build, of course, we're gonna be using supplies that we got almost exclusively from Pops. Popsknife.supplies. Eventually, the shape of the blade has revealed itself. Now it's off to drill the various holes that will hold the handle and guard in place. In his book, Loveless uses 3 8 inch Loveless bolts on his blade, so he uses a number 19 drill. I'm actually using quarter inch bolts, so I'll use a slightly smaller drill. I'll also drill a thong tube hole for a quarter inch thong hole. 
Later I'll be drilling holes for the guard, but I'm not going to drill those until after I've actually made the guard itself. With the knife roughly in shape, I'll move on to tapering the tangs and then grinding the bevels. In order to make sure that these operations are done symmetrically, we'll scribe parallel reference lines here. Loveless recommends using a height gauge to do that, so that's what we'll do too, putting the lines 60 thou from the edges. Now the tapering. He grinds a short taper right at the edge of the tang, right down to the reference line. That little short taper is easy to see, and all you have to do is grind right down to it, and you know you're exactly where you want to be. True to form, Loveless uses the wheel to hog off some of the material. Once he's got it well established, he'll go ahead and finish the taper on the flat platen. Here Pops has supplied me with a Norton Blaze ceramic abrasive. I'll start with 36 grit and move to higher grits later. The book shows some kind of little tool that he uses to apply pressure to the lower tang hole, which helps you apply extra pressure to the part that requires the most grinding. I just use this piece of wood ground to a point so that it'll fit in the hole. Does the same thing, a lot easier to make, and it works great. There are tons of ways of grinding tapered tangs, including using things like surface grinding attachments on your grinder, but this works absolutely fine. I've marked exactly where I want the taper to terminate, basically right at the bottom of the eventual location of the guard. Once I start getting close, I'll change to a 120 grit belt just to avoid putting inadvertent scratches up on the blade. Eventually, the shape of the blade has revealed itself. The only piece of the puzzle that can't be solved on the grinder is the seat for the guard. In the book, Bob files it out of the guard slot, but I'm entirely confident that in real life he milled it, so I'll do that too. I could be wrong, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. If you want to do this at home, though, you can do like the book says and just file the whole thing out. It'll take a while, but it's definitely doable. Using a file with a safe edge ground into it, I'll round the front face of the guard notch. The reason for this is that the slot in the guard is also milled and so it has a rounded front edge. So now let's turn to the guard. You can buy guards like this in standard sizes, but like a great many other parts of this project, I did this one the hard way. I started with this piece of 3 8 inch brass from Pops. Using a 1 8 inch end mill, I milled out a slot a thou or so over the thickness of the blade stock. The guard has a little rebate for the finger, which I ground in using one of the small wheel attachments on my Amera braid. Fitting these things perfectly takes quite a bit of fussing. The old approach to guards using solder, and that's what we're doing here today, because old school, right, was partly a way of covering up relatively loose fitting guards. These days, the fashion is to fit them super tightly so that solder isn't really required. Even though I let this come out a little looser than I normally would, it still takes a ton of messing around to get a guard fitted properly. There it is. So now, the bevels. Loveless recommends grinding a little short 45 degree bevel to make the correct distance a little more visible than just using the scribed line. Same deal as with the tapered tang. I'm using a 12 inch diameter wheel, a little bigger than Loveless. I don't have the same size wheels he does, though personally for beveling, I'd use the largest wheel you can possibly find. There seems to be some mystique about hollow grinding, but honestly I don't find it any harder than flat grinding. The key to it is you have to establish a nice clean groove and then find that groove with each pass and just keep expanding it. 
Again, I'm starting with a 36 grit ceramic, in this case a Norton Blaze from Pops. Eventually I want to bring the grind line all the way to the top of the blade. So I'll get very close with the 36 grit, then move on to higher grits. Loveless recommends going up basically 60, 120, 220 on up to a slightly worn 500 grit AO belt. But there are so many different belt choices today that I think you can probably do better as your final grind before you mirror polish. This is the sort of thing where a structured abrasive can be really nice. Now it's on to heat treating. If you don't have heat treating gear, there are a number of heat treating houses out there that will do it for you. In my case, I've got the gear, so I'll go into the oven at 1900 Fahrenheit, soak for 30 minutes, and then plate quench. Yes, you can plate quench a taper tang knife. You just have to sort of think through the geometry and pay attention. Temper at 400 degrees. Look, this build is very long and very complex, so in order to avoid an endless video, I'm gonna bust this one in half, first half today, second will come out in a couple of days. Um, anyway, I uh, hope you've enjoyed this one, and I'll see you back in the second half shortly. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years, so I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com